Okay. Good morning. <laughs> you hear this today. So um, we we start again from where we left uh, yesterday. Um, so where we calculate an observable R. And we express it in terms of a power series in alpha s. Alpha s is our small expansion parameter directions. So by imposing that this observable is independent from the choice of this arbitrary scale u, then we found the solution of the regularization group equation. And this solution is teaching us something very, very important to keep in mind, is that if we don't want large logs, uh, in our result, if we want our perturbative series to be well behaved, we have to choose uh, alpha s at the scale comparable uh, with the scale of the process. If we do so, right, if we choose uh, mu square order alpha s, uh, mu square order s, then our perturbative series is expressed of a1 and a2, and there are no explicit logs. So the explicit logs that we find when we compute uh, a cross-section and higher order are nothing else than telling us uh, how alpha s should evolve with the scale. So if we choose a scale, in this log, a log of s over mu squared, if you choose mu squared order of s, then uh, they formally disappear, which means that we have resumed them in the evolution of alpha s, okay, through the evolution of alpha s. So our perturbative series is well behaved where if we choose a scale of order of the process. Okay. Then we also show the right, I mean check your notes because I think in the final step of the derivation I left the two, and that's was maybe why you were confused after when we discussed this uh, um, evolution and this real shape group equation. So the beta function is order alpha square. So alpha s goes like one over e log. And this is shown in this plot here. We said that if you have uh, a theory which is asymptotically free, you can choose a reference scale lambda a small values, right? And values of order one GV. And formally, at that point, my perturbative expansion doesn't work anymore. So this, that I cannot make prediction down here. And then it evolves. Uh, it, go, it goes, it gets smaller, and this is exactly the opposite behavior of QED, which, however, as you see from this plot, uh, start to be um, strongly interacting, right? B bigger than 1% at scales which are way above uh, the Planck scale. Okay, so this uh, is uh, uh, the result of uh, yesterday's lecture. So it's something about the behavior of, the, of QED at high energy. So we found a theory, we found that the theory, the non abelian uh, gauge theory associated to color, so the, the symmetry made local, through the, you start with a global symmetry related to color, we, we asked it to be local symmetry. We got an interaction which has the property that uh, we were expecting from scaling, right? So it's strongly interacting at low energy and low scales and uh, is uh, weakly interacting, it starts to be free, so to speak, and high scales. So this is the magic uh, of non-abelian gauge theories, and uh, as uh, Marco explained yesterday, coming from one of your questions, um, this can only be done through uh, non-abelian uh, theories, right, for, for this kind of, of um, processes. Now, today, uh, we, swi we switch completely region, let's say, in respect to ultraviolet, Today we only basically talk about the long distance. Right? So this lecture is a bit intense. I hope to make it, uh, it will be a bit longer than one hour and a half. Uh, but I really want to give you the gist of how events are behave at the LHC. So we still have a little bit uh, of uh, road to cover. So today we look, uh, we start looking at the plus and minus and next to living order. We mentioned this yesterday just because we wanted to look uh, at the behavior in the ultraviolet, and the behavior in the ultraviolet is given by the loops. However, the behavior in the infrared, so the long distance behavior of your theory, is given by the sum of all diagrams, which come order by order. So today we are interested in seeing what are the infrared properties, what happens to QCD when a gluon, mm, okay, which is emitted, for example, becomes either soft, 
Soft means that its energy is much smaller than the energy of the central mass here scattering, or either collinear to the final state particles. Okay? So what we will discover is that configuration in phase space where a global is either soft or collinear are greatly enhanced. Okay? So they are dominant in the in the phase space. Uh, and therefore we will need uh, if we if you want to give a, a, a full description of this event, we will need order by order to take them into account and resum them also. So there will be a, the need of a resummation uh, here also in the infrared in the case uh, only in the case to start to be more exclusive, we want to give more details on the final state than just computing total cross-section. Okay, so for total cross-section, um, there is a theorem, right, for full inclusive observable, there is a theorem that guarantees, in the KLN theorem, that guarantees that uh, the sensitivity to long distance, so uh, infrared uh, behavior in this calculation is cancelled if we sum over um, phase space, which include both the virtual contribution and the real ones. So the, the theorem says that basically if I compute uh, the integral of the real corrections over the phase space of three particles, Okay, inclusively, so over all possible configuration, and I sum it to it uh, the contribution from the virtuals, the result is finite. Okay? So why, what is the physical origin of this uh, uh, theorem? Well, it's basically saying that the infinities, so these divergences, which I'm going to explain where they come from in a moment, uh, come both uh, show up in the virtual and the real, Actually, uh, they exactly match up in a way uh, that inclusive cross sections become insensitive to that. Okay? So, if you sum, if you are in inclusive enough on the final state, you will not be sensitive to this uh, long distance behavior. In other words, if you build an observable, like we did here, where I don't, I never ask the hadrons go, which hadrons I have, and so on. I will never be sensitive to physics, uh, which is uh, long distance, apart from, of course, the power corrections. I have, in this case, means that I have to be uh, in high energy, right, that I am not to the detail of how particles hadronize. If I go to low energy, I start to be sensitive, right? I start seeing resonances or features in phase space which are really related to the way that particles are hadronizing. Okay? Yes. No, I think that they are strongly related, right? I'm saying that this, uh, uh, in a sense, so this theorem, for example, works also for QED, right? Where I don't have the problem of modernization, right? The, my final state. So th this kind of argument works through for QED. But in QCD, we have this extra issue, right? That, that in lost case, my, my theorem becomes strongly interacting by degrees of change. Eh? Lecture ago, so we have a, a completion, a UV completion. Our you know, it goes down, right? So from our UV completion, we go to another theory with different degree of freedom, and therefore we have this additional issue to take care of. Okay, so it's true what you say is true. I mean, this goes through also here for QED where we don't have this problem, but in QED we have to keep in mind both, right? We have to be somewhat uh, sensitive to both uh, issues at the same time. Well, well, the problem, you know, you have to define inclusiveness in terms of physical states, yes. and, and then uh, you have to say, okay, I, if, uh, even if I ask, the, for example, the momentum of a pion, right, then the, the, the formalism changes completely, right? I have to, have to introduce a fragmentation function and so on, right? So what I'm saying, you know, the, the link, if you want, between QED and, uh, and QCD, you can do it at a full inclusive level easily. 
right? And that's what we will do over and over today, okay? So, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, start doing the computation. So, we, we ignore, so to speak, uh, the uh, ultraviolet problem to, to the, we ignore. We don't have to take care of it, we don't ignore it. Because we said yesterday, right, that the sum of these diagrams, the vertex corrections and the wave function corrections, in the first order, it's finite. So I don't have to renormalize my theory in next to leading order. And the reason is that there is no alpha s to renormalize, right, in leading order. So and that's consistent with the QED charge conservation and with the fact that uh, QED is renormalizable, but since the Born has no alpha s, I can get any divergence. So um, I start, in the, the problem of infrared divergence is common to both virtual and real contributions. But it's easier to see in the case of the real. So let me compute the contribution from the real. So this, uh, this amplitude is the sum, sorry, this amplitude is the sum of two terms, uh, of two diagrams, uh, which I write in this way. So this is a K. So the sum of these two diagram, uh, I have to sum both diagrams to have a gauge invariant result. Th the amplitude is proportional to the color of the gluon, right? There is uh, one gluon is, uh, so this is A, I, J, is a core production. And then I have two, two propagators, right? So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm writing uh, P plus K squared, okay, in the propagator here. Then I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm taking massless work. And so I get two terms. Now, you see immediately that in, in, when I do a computation in, uh, in, in QCD, for example, the the diverge, the soft uh, and collinear divergences and the peaks, uh, let's say, the peaks in the, in the matrix element always come from the propagator, right? Because the numerator is a polynomial. The only way that can get very large results, very large uh, contributions, is from uh, denominators getting small. So I have two ways so that the denominator gets small. One way is to hit a massive resonance, right? And then uh, I parameterize it with the uh, Drive Wigner and they get a peak in the cross section, right? Because the propagator gets small and gets one over gamma m. The other way is to, uh, in this case, I have massless particle, okay? So if I write this propagator here, this will be 2 p0 k0 1 minus cos theta. And you see that in the denominator, two regions where this can blow up. Is when k0 is small, okay, and uh, the other region is when this 1 minus cos theta, right, is uh, 0, okay, it goes to 0, which means uh, when the glue is either collinear, right, the two momenta are collinear, you get that this dot product, uh, theta equal goes to 0 goes to zero, this dot product becomes zero, and there is a, a, a blow up in the amplitude. So, the region of phase space, which give the largest, where is the largest contribution from this matrix element, is around these two regions, right? One which is soft, and one which is collinear. If you look at the other denominator, I discover, right, this is completely symmetric, so I will have uh, two regions. One when this gluon is soft in general, independent of where it goes, and one region and two regions where I, this gluon is collinear to this part, or this gluon is collinear to the other. There are two collinear regions and one. So one thing to keep in mind, one thing to remember always: one 
So divergence is called collinear, and this is soft. So here, soft means that the wavelength of the gluon is larger, right? Okay, so a, wave, a gluon whose wavelength is large means that I cannot resolve the details of high Q square interaction, right? I mean, a, a gluon, which is soft by definition, right, it cannot tell, you cannot tell if it has been emitted from this line or from this line, right? It's, emit, it's emitted in a classical sense, uh, like in the Jackson sense, uh, if you want, where it's emitted from the whole antenna, from the whole uh, pattern of radiation of these two charges, which are accelerated by the interaction of this photon, okay? So remember, a soft gluon, you cannot tell where it comes from in an amplitude. While a collinear divergence, the, the gluon in general, in a collinear divergence, can also be hard, right? It can be both, right? In a collinear divergence, it can be both. It can be both soft or hard. It doesn't matter. The only thing that, uh, uh, well, say, can be small, the thing that matters is where it goes. So, a collinear divergence is localized. I know where it comes from, because I'm localizing it in phase space close to one of the two quarks. Okay, so this is the main difference between a collinear and a soft divergence. Collinear, I know where it comes from. I know which parton is responsible for. Okay, while a soft one is distributed over all partons in the colored, part, charged partons in the event. Okay. Yes. Exactly. I, I'm going to, to, to tell. In fact, we are now w going to work in the soft approximation, which, however, has also the collinear one in, his, uh, in it. Right? So now we, we are working. So I'm not going to make this computation exact for the moment. Right? So I'm choosing the soft uh, approximation. And I can show you, you know, it's easy to show right, that even if you choose the soft one where this pole is dominating, then you always take also this one with you, the collinear one with you, okay? So there is a, a region of phase space where, of course, there are both, right? There is a corner of phase space where radiation can be soft and collinear. And we will see that this, so either soft or collinear gives a log, and the soft and the collinear region give a double log, a log square. So these are other agencies. Okay, so here, right, there is a beautiful, very simple result you can get in a, in a, in a moment, right? So if in the soft limit, so now I'm taking the soft limit, kappa is small, k is small, so I can, I can uh, neglect it in the numerator. Okay, and then uh, I can use uh, the equation of motion to, um, so, so I can, um, let's say, use the equation of motion to, uh, and uh, the anti-commutation of the gamma uh, to bring uh, P close to U, or U of V. And the result is that I can write that A is soft. So there are two operations that you have to do. So, if you uh, if you do this operation, basically, what, what the result is that you can rewrite this amplitude here in terms of a Born amplitude, which is uh, u bar gamma v, where by by when I exchange the, the two gamma, I get a minus one minus gamma mu, right? And gamma nu, the the one the gamma mu gamma nu gets zero because of the Dirac equation, is a G mu nu. And the G mu gives uh, a momentum P mu, which is contracted with the uh, polarization vector. Okay? So you see what happens. Something magical, right? 
you rewrite your amplitude for a soft emission in terms of a born amplitude times a factor, right? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't talk this uh, uh, born, so we say it factorizes. And this term uh, is, uh, as, is uh, enough famous to have a name, it's called iconal. Okay. So this term you see as, uh, as uh, a, a very interesting property. There, is no, there are no gamma matrices anymore here. All the, all the spin information is left to the, uh, to the Born. So there are only momenta here. These are product momenta. There is no gammas. Which means that uh, a soft photon is, does not see the spin of the Okay? So spin information, if you want, uh, is uh, a short, uh, a short distance information, okay, if you want, roughly speaking, because the, a soft gluon cannot have information on the spin. The, the spin structure, right, so in other words, a, a, a soft gluon will not change uh, uh, anyway the, the spin of a quark. And therefore, the effect of a soft radiation only um, deals with the momenta, mm, it's spin independent. And the, the other property of, uh, of this factor here is that you see that the, the denominator, right, is, uh, is the same as before. So this reasoning about soft and collinear uh, divergences is intact even in the limit. So you can see both in this case. Okay? So it's a good approximation for studying both soft and collinear limit. You have questions? And also, the other, the other point which is important is also color, in this case, uh, as factorized out. But this is only coincidence of the fact that there is no color structure, basically, in this diagram to start from. Okay? So don't be tricked by the fact that the TA has been factored out out. Right? So this is, a pro this is the main difference of QED and QCD. If I did this in QED, I would not have a color. And in QED, the structure would have been repeating itself uh, over and over. Because uh, if I had a QED radiation, you can show right, very easily that uh, in QED, if I write this amplitude, I can, factor, I can rewrite it in terms of a product of iconals, of antennas. And it's a recursive property of the amplitude in QED. I can rewrite this as a sum of all permutations of the emission of a photon. And I can write that, I can see that this is a product of terms like this one. So the amplitude in the soft uh, limit, right, in QED, it factors exactly. The reason is that when I emit a photon, right, the next photon doesn't care about this one, right? Because this doesn't carry color or any charge in QED. Therefore, the, once this is emitted, this photon, which is soft, doesn't see at all this photon. Right? It doesn't know if it has been emitted or not. While if it is QCD, eh, remember right, that when I, whenever I emit a gluon, I can use this double line formalism that I was talking before, right, where a gluon is a quark and anti-quark. So if I emit a gluon from this line, actually, I'm breaking it, right? Co from the color flow point of view, I'm breaking this, l this uh, antenna in two antennas. So the emission of a gluon, since the gluon carries color, has an effect on the pattern of radiation. Because now, the next gluon, which is soft, uh, say, whoa, one second, right? It's like, touch to, to this color line, to this antenna, or I can attach to this one. I have two choices now. And the two soft limits are different. Okay? So a soft gluon which will attach here will be different in physics from a soft gluon which will attach here. Huh? And the two, in fact, don't interfere, at, um, so all interfere in one over n. Therefore, this picture, this kind of planar picture remains. Okay, you got the, did you get the gist? So don't be tricked by the fact that here the color factorizes, because in general, right, when start, now I start adding radiation to something which is colored, then the next gluon 
we'll start seeing, uh, uh, we'll start realizing that there was a TA here. Okay. You got it? Okay, very good. So let me go on. So when I, I can square this amplitude now, So, so this icon of factor is universal. Okay, so this is a universal property of soft radiation in uh, in the case of massless and spin one particles. So what I get if I square it. I factorize the ball, get the cross section for the ball, I get the GS square, I get the color factor, right, the trace of uh, TATB, no. uh, uh, TATA, sorry, and, and then I get the integral where the phase of the gluon two times P, P bar, PK, P bar K. So this is the iconal uh, square. When you square this amplitude, you see that the result uh, is the very simple term here. So this object, um, I can rewrite it in terms of cos theta and K zero. So let me do it now. So this is the integral in d cos theta dk0 over k0 over 1 minus cos theta 1 plus cos theta, which is, uh, if you want, uh, uh, same square theta. So there, there are as I said, there is a, a soft divergence, and when integrating cos theta between minus 1 and 1, right, there are two collinear regions in this, uh, um, in this uh, term. In fact, I can also write approximately, approximately this term here, I can rewrite it in, uh, in this way. Where now I, 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 I keep, for example, because this cos theta is the angle, so minus one, you are at, one, at the anti-quark, and one, you are in the quark, but I can introduce another angle, which is the distance from the, the anti-quark, and I can rewrite this term, basically, the, apart from a numerator, which is a, uh, which is a small term, as a sum of two terms, right? One minus cos theta with respect to one quark, and the cos theta bar, which is the angle with respect to the this is completely symmetric. But what is interesting in this form, right, is that I, this way of writing suggests that, and I will write in the following, not right now, suggests that I can write this term as sum of two independent terms. Each one is the radiation for the collinear, you see, for the collinear divergence, I can write this as a two terms, one which is the emission of soft gluon from the quark, and the other which is emission of the soft and collinear, right, because I'm taking the soft and collinear in this case, uh, approximation of the anti-quark, you see? I sum these two, okay? Yeah, but I exactly. But in the what, what I'm saying in collinear limit, you know, right? So I, I'm just taking general soft, uh, and then I'm I'm separating the phase space into the collinear region. In the soft and collinear, I know where it comes from, right? Okay. So yes. No, cos theta bar. Sorry, is one minus cos theta. 1 minus cos theta bar. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, you. No, what I'm saying is that there are two leading regions, right? I mean, uh, this I can I can break break up one minus cos theta divided one plus cos theta, right? I can change uh, if you want theta into theta bar, just to show that I can write this as a two as a sum of two terms of two independent emissions of collinear emissions, and the collinear emission can be also soft, right? In that case, uh, I can bring, uh, so, in other words, this thing, I can write them as a sum over the quark and anti-quark, okay, of uh, uh, d cos theta, so something, right, which is uh, d k zero over k zero, and just one term. Yeah, I mean, I, so. So, and th this will be the sum, so instead of writing this as one object, I write it as the sum of two emissions. One from the quark and one from the anti-quark. That's what I want to do. Yeah. No, that means that so the one when the gluon is collinear to the quark, and the one where the gluon is collinear to the other guy, which here is theta equal uh, zero, right, and theta equal phi. Okay, because this guy is soft, right? So soft means that basically these two quarks have the same momentum. So you, you have either this or that. Okay. So this property is useful. We will do it. Uh, we will use it in the following. So, and, but this is extremely important. You can the, the fact that you can split it in the sum of two pieces means that you can somewhat uh, partition. You can partition the soft divergence among the the lines among the colored patterns. Okay. The only thing to be careful is when you do or if you do double counting. Okay. But you can. So this fact that the, if you partition in this way is correct, right? This this way you this is the total divergence and they rewritten in two terms. Each one is somewhat uh, lead associated to the linear region of each of the emitted parts and includes, however, the uh, um, the soft uh, uh, the soft divergence. Okay. So now I'm also uh, I'm also doing uh, a, a so I'm I'm losing if you want all the uh, terms which are proportional to k zero in the numerator right? because I'm doing the I'm doing the soft limit I'm not leading term in k in one over kappa zero so in general in the amplitude we'll also have numer com you know terms in the numerator which are proportional to kappa zero okay to k zero. Because you will see that this is the the case. Okay, so I can try uh, can show this region if I introduce uh, two variables x one and x two. So x one is two e q divided by square root of s, and x two is two e q bar divided by square root of s. So this is the phase space. Instead of using d cos theta and dk0, I can use x1 and x2. I'm not going into detail. I just want to, to say that in that case, uh, the cross-section uh, can be written in this way. So this is the same as this in these two new variables. And in this plot, you see that the divergences, the soft and collinear divergences, come from the border. The phase. This is always true, right? Uh, the typically, right, since it comes from collinear and soft uh, configuration, the the divergences come from the edges of the possible phase space. Here, the radiation is hard. 
Then when I go in this direction, I get closer. So this is a collinear region. This is collinear. So radiation is hard, but if I move close in this direction, I get here I get close to the other quark. And in, in, in this corner here, I get soft. Right? When x1 is 1 and x2 is 2, it means uh, x1 and x2 are the fraction of energy uh, of the quark. So if the fraction of energy is maximal, it means that the, there is no leftover energy. And that means that I'm in the so you see that you can approach the soft limit from the collinear limit in two different directions. But there is only one, right? So I have to be careful that if I do this and this, I don't double count. Okay? Very good. So uh, uh, this is a, 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 a picture which is uh, possibly useful. Now, we know, right? So we see that the, there are divergences in the phase space. When I integrate, right, when I really integrate my phase space, I get the log from here, if I integrate, right, from k0 to 0 to the energy my scattering, or if I integrate theta from minus 1 to 1, I get the log from here, and twice, if you want, the log from here, because there are two regions where it's collinear. So in the soft and collinear region, I get the log squared. In the, so in this point, I get the log squared, if I go this way. If I'm here, I get the log. But my I have divergences which are logarithmic. Now, I know from the, from the K-Line theorem that the virtual contribution will have to cancel these divergences, okay? Now, the virtual are sitting exactly here, right? Because this is a three-body phase space. My virtual has no, uh, has no extra radiation, right? So a, a, a real event will be something like this, is a three-body. But a virtual, right? A virtual has no real emission, therefore has the same kinematics as the Born, huh? Which means that it has the, the particles, the quarks here, as exactly half of the energy. Which means that the barn sits exactly at this point in phase space. Where exactly where the soft divergences and collinear divergences appear from the real. Okay? So that is uh, certainly uh, what we want, uh, right? At least from this uh, analysis. And therefore, I can guess, uh, you know, I don't want to compute now the cross-section, but I can guess that the differential cross-section written in terms of a three-body phase space, so I can rewrite also my uh, virtual in terms of a three-body phase space, but then using deltas, okay? So I, the, the, the phase space of a, of a virtual is a two-body, so I rewrite it in terms of three-body, but then I use deltas to go back to a two. So it's a trick, so I rewrite it in the same way, and then I will have uh, something like two delta k0 uh, times delta one minus cos theta, delta one plus cos theta. Okay. So, so in other words, uh, the, the virtual, I know that we'll have to cancel uh, this logarithmic enhancement that come from, uh, uh, from the, um, from the real corrections. So the way I do it, right, I, I use dimensional regularization as usual. Right, so something which is divergent as a log, for example, I change the dimension, I, I introduce a, a minus two epsilon in the numerator, and this gives one minus one over two epsilon. So to do this integral, either I do this way, right, or I, I just change the dimension of my space, I introduce an epsilon, and the log diverges, become poles in one over epsilon square, 
the double log becomes 1 over epsilon square, and uh, the single log becomes 1 over epsilon. So the result for the two contributions, so I'm, I'm not doing the, the calculation obviously, I'm guessing it if you want, from the fact that the K-line theorem tells me that this, this log divergence has to cancel. So the real is equal to the born uh, CF uh, alpha S over 2 pi 2 epsilon squared plus 3 over epsilon plus 19 over 2 minus P squared is exact calculation. The virtual is equal to the born again F alpha S 2 pi minus 2 over epsilon squared minus 3 over epsilon minus 8 plus P squared. So you have to do it, right? It's not that, uh, so for, for, for this term you can guess them from the log. Actually, this coefficient you can guess. You can find them without using just the soft limit. But the finite terms uh, you have to compute. And you see that magically, right? Not magically, but as we expected, this cancel. The pi square actually cancel. And the result uh, is that R1, so the first term uh, in R, is exactly what we said it would be. It's an extremely simple result. Is a CF, actually, so is a CF times 3 fourth pi. And CF uh, is 4 thirds in, uh, in uh, N, uh, SU3, and therefore I get 1 over pi uh, uh, alpha, sorry, <laughs> alpha S over pi. Okay, thanks. So, alpha S over pi. So this term is 1, and I get the correction. Everything is fine, and no renormalization. Okay? So, we have, you can do this computation yourself, it's very instructive to do it from the beginning to the end. Uh, actually, in, ma in the exercises I proposed, uh, there is a, a complementary uh, exercise, which is the one where you compute uh, a production uh, of the Higgs uh, from glue glue, which has all these issues. It's a bit more complicated than this, but is uh, you know the exercise I proposed for you to learn uh, how to do a next reading order computation in PP collision. Okay, not any plus and minus because this is too simple, right? For for nowadays. You don't see all the issues. Okay, so the result is final. And the infra you have no depend no sensitivity to the infrared and linear regions if you look inclusively in the final state. Okay. Good. So now before uh, going on into uh, trying to explain you what you know, how we turn partons into a final state, which are more realistic. I discussed uh, uh, as uh, quickly as I can, uh, but also as in detail as I can, uh, what happens, what is the, pi how the picture changes if instead of doing an LO computation in E plus E minus, I do an LO computation in AS. Okay? Because this will tell us what is the main difference between an E plus E minus collider, where QCD is all in the final state, with respect to a PP collider, or VIS collider, right, E minus uh, P collider, where you have an initial state which is an hadron. So there's a conceptual difference which leads uh, to a, a, an enormous number of uh, results and uh, needs from the perturbative point of view, which I just want to uh, mention. Okay? You have questions? So what what is different? What changes in DIS? So you say, well, DIS is the same, right? Because uh, you you told me, right, we used the, so we, we took this amplitude here Okay, and uh, 
this amplitude, and you told us when you did the computation on the factor model that this was just in, uh, so this is E uh, plus E minus, and VI is just, uh, is just this. So I'm, I'm the same Feynman diagram with T channel. So what, what's the problem, right? I mean, I will get exactly the same uh, results because uh, as, uh, as before, I will not see, right? Uh, I will not see if uh, start emitting and making corrections here, right? So now this, uh, my, I start including my corrections. And then I will have uh, things like this. And uh, everything looks the same. So if I sum over my uh I will get rid of all divergences as before. But no, well, this is an electron, right? You mean this? So the, this is this upper part of the diagram is factorized from QED because, right, from QCD. Okay, so it's the same as before. Pardon? Exactly, exactly. There is a difference. There is a difference. There are two differences. First, this is not all the diagrams that I get. I also get this diagram. Right? Because this now is different from this. Because uh, you see that whenever I fish out a, a parton in the proton, I have to multiply it by its corresponding uh, PDF. Right? Well, let me write this way. So its corresponding probability of finding it. So these two terms, why? Before, right, the real was just kind of one real, right? You have the glue into one line or another, but you didn't make any distinction. Now, you are implicitly and explicitly asking more than before. You are not as inclusive as in E plus e minus. Why? Because you are telling which pro parton was in the initial state. You are saying, I'm fishing this guy. And now I'm fishing this one. You make, you're distinguishing between, for example, you're making a distinction between these two that before were the same, were in the same uh, pot. So since uh, each of these diagrams will have to be multiplied by an F, and this from, so this will be an F of quark, and this will be an F of a, of a gluon, right? So at this point, I, I really, first of all, I see that these two terms don't, uh, uh, you know, belong to different bins, to different boxes, in my calculation. And the other point is that I'm not inclusive, right? I'm not ignoring, you know, I'm not ignoring the fact that if I have a gluon close, right, to a photon, I sum over all of them, right? I'm inclusive. I'm including the finals. I don't make a distinction. Here, I'm making a distinction because I have a proton in the initial state. Okay? So I cannot include everything. I cannot be inclusive in the initial state. In the, whenever I describe my, my process, I'm exclusive in the initial state. And this is the beginning of the end, right? Because uh, if you, you, you know, we said that if you start to be exclusive, you run into issues, you run into problems. And that's exactly what we see here for the first time. The fact that in DIS you have QCD in the initial state, so you are exclusive. You're saying, well, there's a proton in my, you know, back in time, in my asymptotic limit back then, there was a proton. I'm saying something. Okay? So I'm not, I'm no more inclusive in the past, but I'm not inclusive. Like, like, like this? Yeah, yeah. Those are there. Yeah, because this is, for the moment, yeah, it's very small. But we don't ignore it. 
No, no. So actually, you know, like, uh, okay, we don't ignore it. It's like the work of this year, there was a beautiful result by uh, Anish Manoir, Paolo Nazon, and so on, about the, the photon uh, contribution from the proton. And there's a beautiful result where they actually use exactly DIS to, uh, to determine on the other side, let's say, well, okay, I don't want to, <laughs> to tell the whole story now, but I mean, it's a beautiful result to constrain the photon content of the photon using DIS the other way around, right? Uh, normally, yes, we constrain the quark content and the gluon content, but you can also constrain the photon. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, if you are at high energy enough, right, you also will have a Z or a W or even a lepton, right? So, Marco can tell, where is Marco? Yeah, can tell you about everything, about how, what is the probability of finding an, an electron into a proton, okay? It's a, an electron weak effect coming up at higher orders, but it's there. So, you know, if you have a super high energy collider, at some point, uh, you might find it useful to describe uh, even photons and electrons coming from the proton directly. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not going that far. From so, let me exp so what what we if we do this computation, right? If we do this computation now, so this is our F uh, two quark hat. So what we said, right, that this was E Q square X delta one minus X. Then what we find indeed uh, is that if we do this computation we get all soft divergences cancelling we get uh, the, f the collinear divergence in the final state cancelling because now you see there will be also the diagram with the glue emitted from the final state but I'm integrating in the phase space of the final state so the, the collinear divergence in the final state cancels correctly no problem with that but I'm left over with a divergence in the initial state. So instead of using uh, dimensional regularization here, for this, it doesn't matter, right? Here you will get a 1 over epsilon in this uh, scheme that I'm talking about. Now we have an explicit log and I use the a glue of mass, okay? You, you can regulate from the either giving, uh, so here there is no Lillian interactions, right? So I can also give a small mass to the gluon, it will not break dramatically. Uh, so I can, uh, uh, I can do Or I give a, a mass, so here I give a mass to the gluon, and here I give a small mass to the quark. This is enough to regulate the collinear divergence. Yeah, yeah. So here is a regulator. So it tells me there is a log divergence. When this goes to zero, I get a log divergence. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, if you want, in dimensional regularization, this is one over epsilon. Okay, as you like. If you are more comfortable seeing it as a one over epsilon, keep uh, doing it. This way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change. So this is PQQ. So it's a universal function. Who knows about the uh, splitting functions? I guess everybody must have heard of them at least once. So this is uh, the, uh, sorry, this PQQ is nothing else than the probability, uh, the probability, the, the kinematical uh, dependence of this splitting, right, of a quark, a, a quark, retaining a fraction of momentum z of the initial quark, okay? So this is like cf 1 plus d squared 1 minus d. And you see that when z is 1, this has a soft divergence, right? This becomes uh, 1 over 1 minus d, which is the soft divergence associated to this quark. I also have this uh, function, right, which will be the same, uh, but one with the uh, z in minus d. Okay? 
So in this case, uh, the, the, the infrared part is uh, already, when, when the fraction of energy goes to zero, I get the fold one over z. Okay, so this is the same, you see, this is exactly the same thing that we had before. When I had the delta k0 over k0, k0 is the energy, so I can always write it as a fraction of initial part of energy. So this is uh, going to one over, uh, is a dz over z uh, divergence. Okay, so you have this. Then of course you can also have uh, a, a gluon splitting into a, a pair or a gluon going into two gluons. In this case, this is proportional to Tf and this is proportional to Ca. Now this object will have a pole in one in Z and in one minus Z because both of them can be soft. This object has no soft divergences Right? Because when one quark goes uh, soft, it doesn't diverge. It's an only polar one. So here, this diagram, this diagram, so I'm erasing your beloved photon, just because otherwise <laughs> I get confused. So this diagram has no soft, it's an only a collinear divergence. This has a soft and collinear, but the soft cancels. The only thing that I'm left with is a collinear. So the other term which I get, so from this guy here, from this guy, I get an F2G, which was not a leading order, right? Remember, so the sum of our quarks. So zero. Remember, this th there, there is no contribution from the gluon in the partial model, because uh, the gluon does not interact directly with the photon. It has to emit. It has to turn into a quark pair, and this costs a factor of alpha s. And then here, what you will have? Which p will you have here? p? No, it's called the qg. Right, so remember the, the p are a final initial. Okay, so uh, this thing here is a QG. It's a G which splits the Q on the other side, on the other way. Okay, so that's the convention. G. Okay, good. So that now you will remember. And here we use uh, a quark mass. Okay, so. We find uh, that there is uh, a divergence, which is a collinear in nature. However, and that's, uh, we don't see it here, but you should have to do the computation in another process, like in PP. This kind of structure is universal. So that's the point. The point is, yeah, it's true. I'm going to have corrections which are infinite, but they are universal. That means that I can always, I can always think that instead of cutting my diagram here and finding the collinear divergence in the final space, in the fine uh, phase space, I can try to cut it here, right, to say, well, okay, if this is collinear, then it belongs to my PDF, and what I really see is a quark hitting a photon. The collinear term, I can redefine my PDF to include it. Because the PDF is not a physical object. It's like alpha s. When I get an ultraviolet uh, divergence, I reabsorb it in alpha s. It's an MSMAR parameter. I can do the same in the infrared with the, my PDFs. Uh, with my, well, here I don't show the PDF yet, but with a PDF, I can do it. So the, the idea is exactly this, is exactly that given that this uh, splitting function and this behavior, you see, you see it from here, right? If I imagine to cut it here, I don't care what is the short distance part. The evolution, of, so this kind of dynamics depends only on the coupling of the gluons to the quarks how many quarks you have, but it will never depend, uh, for example, on the charge of the quark. 
Because it's all like a QCD, right? It's a QCD thing. It's not, uh, uh, it's not, it does not know anything about the short distance part. Now, there is also another way of thinking about it, which I like more, I'm coming to your question, is the fact that in the collinear limit, right, so I told you that this is a problem in the collinear limit, right? So in the collinear limit, what happens is actually this, right? Something like this. So there is a gluon split into two collinear quarks, and this quark here has a very small virtuality. Okay? This guy has a very small virtuality. It's almost on shell, right? It's exactly where the collinear divergences come from, remember? I told you that they come from this region in the final state, but what is the virtuality of this particle when these two are closed? Well, it will be the invariant mass of these two, but this invariant mass is going to zero. So what you really have here is a pole in the invariant mass of this quark. So if, they, if this quark is almost on its mass shell, it means that it lives a long time. Right? So it's a virtual state, but the time associated to this uh, virtual state is very long, right? So if this Q square, if this Q square is much, much smaller than the Q square, which is S, uh, a set uh, in the E plus E minus, right? It means that time-wise, from the time point of view, there has been the short distance interaction, and then way after, right, this quark has splitted into a quark and a gluon. And that's the reason, that's the basics of the factorization idea. The factorization tells you that when you have virtuality which are widely different, you can reorganize your, your perturbative expansion by factorizing uh, event, uh, things happening, right? Physics uh, uh, process which happens at a short distance scale from those which happen at long distance. So our definition of a short distance is here. Okay? So what we do, right, will depend on a factorization scale, which is arbitrary, where where I see where I decide where to put my short distance, how to separate my short distance from my long distance. So since this Q square is much smaller, I say, okay, if the Q square is much smaller than mu f, I, I, I put everything of this into, let's say, my PDF, right? I reabsorb uh, this uh, divergence into my PDF, which is uh, not a physical object, so I can reabsorb my divergence as long as it is universal. And the other piece, I consider it like a short distance part, which I calculate in perturbative QCD. So this divergence, the long, this log, when I see the logs which are of infinite nature, is nothing else than saying, be careful, you are choosing a wrong definition of short distance, right? Of something perturbative. You have to factorize the long distance part into non-perturbative objects, and by doing that, you get rid of this sensitivity. Okay? So that's what we, we're going to do. Right? So the, 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 the result of this procedure right, is the suggestion to, at this point, uh, define an, F, an F2, right, which is the physical object, which is X, E squared, so my, my part, so I'm not defining it, I'm, 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 uh, I'm including all, uh, all results for the moment, coming to the definition. So now I write it as a convolution, i explain it in a second. Log of Q squared over M gluon squared plus a finite term. Then uh, what I do? I redefine 
I reabsorb. So I split uh, this log uh, into a log of Q squared divided mu f plus a log of uh, mu f divided by m gluon. Okay, and I reabsorb this one into the definition of f. So my f q will be f q zero alpha s over two pi x one x c f q p q q x over log of mu f, f over mg squared plus a, a term which is a skin dependent term. Okay, so I redefine my f to include uh, the part which is uh, logarithmically divergent exactly exactly as I do with alpha s when I redefine the value of alpha s by putting inside alpha s the log uh, uh, dependence from the, an infinite cutoff to a scale here I'm doing the same I'm redefining my object from my from my cutoff uh, to a scale and then I'm using this as a physical input and that's that's what I will need in my computation okay and by doing this fq becomes dependent on the scale exactly as fs becomes dependent on the scale exactly the same so I expect that this object will start running with me and this is the scaling violation is the fact that the PDF do depend on the scale where they are evaluated when they are measured. So we learned by our renormalization group argument uh, on the plus and minus yesterday that we should choose uh, the value of the renormalization scale of alpha s order of the scale of the process to resum the presence of large logs. And in this case it's exactly the same. We can write RG equations for the F, which are called the DGLAP, okay? So the RG equations for the PDF uh, have a special name, and Oxenster, Gribov, Lip, uh, Lipatov, Altanelli, Parisi equations, which are nothing else than the RG equation for this non-perturbative uh, object, which are the uh, PDF. Someone had a question? Yeah, we, we only consider the elastic piece, yes. Yes. Well, what, what I'm saying is the following. My, okay, the cut means my resolution scale, okay? The, the, the my microscope wavelength. So, depending, and which is mu f. So I measure my my the, my my resolution with a scale which is called which I call mu f. So everything which is uh, shorter, so higher scale than mu f, I put it in the short part, distance part, and some anything which is longer is here. However, the physics is independent of mu f. Therefore, this gives me a renormalization group uh, parameter. Right? And the renormalization group equation to impose that the physics is independent from my resolution. Exactly as uh, any other renormalization group equation. Okay, yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the original papers by Altarelli and so on. Uh, they used quark masses to regulate this, right? But in this case, uh, so you're asking about the physical quark mass now or using as a, using as a regulator? It's a very good question. So 
Um, well, I can spend a couple of hours on that if you want, but uh, in short, right, uh, the number of flavor that we let uh, this equation keep, uh, right, is a skin dependent uh, choice. So we, like in alpha S, we said that we have an NF, right? Also in the PDF, we have an NF. In fact, the set of PDF depends on the scheme of a heavy quark scheme, let's say, how many heavy quarks uh, you let them massless uh, here. So, if, for example, if you are in the five flavor scheme, you have five flavors, so up to the B in the running of alpha S, and here, which means that if you also have a PDF, uh, an F, B here. So even the B, even if the B is 5 GV, right, you say, well, a B cannot live inside a proton because uh, Two Bs uh, is 10 GV already, right? But that's not the way we think, right? The way we think is that uh, if uh, this diagram, if this contribution is dominated by the collinear region, it, so you think this, I'm producing a BB bar, right? But I compute this cross section, a very high energy, this cross section with the BB bar in the final state is dominated by the log uh, in the, can you get it from the phase space from this glue splitting? So then what you do, you resum this log using the PDF of the B. But it's not that you think there is a the proton, it's just a, a QCD tool to do a resummation, uh, a perturbative resummation in that case, and uh, re-express your cross-section without logs, uh, without large logs. So in the five flavor scheme in which we use, nor which is the default in the LHC, the Bs uh, are inside, in, inside the PDF. Okay? We don't include the top, uh, uh, because it's, you know, the, we don't do processes at 100 TV where the top can be considered massless. I mean, where the mass on the top is irrelevant. So there are no large logs for the top. But there are several papers where which show this. No, 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 no. No, no, it's not an issue. It's not an issue. It's a, a technical issue, but not a, a well, okay, I should be careful. But, uh, okay, let's say up to next to next to living order is not an issue. Okay, so uh, why I use the convolution here? Well, just because, uh, uh, remember, right, that our picture, yeah, so our picture was something like this. So we had a Xi here, right? The, the, the one which you fish from the proton, you call it uh, Xi. But then now you have a, a splitting function, so this would be the Xi, right? So if I now think of, of using again my parton model, starting from here, right? Then you should put delta of X minus the Xi, right? So if I include this part here and I go back to my part of model one to one, then this object would have a momentum the x, which is the Bjorken x. Okay. Remember that here x is a physical variable in the IS. It's not a parameter. So if you do this right, then you get, you find easily right that if you do the integral of uh, dx dz f of c sigma of z, right, this uh, delta of x minus uh, cz, this is exactly the convolution, okay? So this is the definition of a convolution. Is uh, the product of two functions which are whose product is tied to one variable on the, on the x, c, z um, product, okay? So this is where this comes from. Okay, so the only thing I left to me to finish now is the fact to, sh to convince you, uh, not to convince uh, you, to show you that thanks to this uh, renormalization group uh, argument, I can now write uh, a uh, renormalization group equation, the DGLAP. And my, my uh, aim in the next 10 minutes is to 
prove right that uh, by looking now how this object evolves when it can probe the, at different scales when passing from uh, I don't know like one GV 10 GV to 100 GV squared I can explain scaling violation and that's what I promised you uh, two lectures ago right remember scale violation the f2 is independent on q square and, and uh, a value of x which are medium right but it increases with q square and small x and get get smaller and larger x so the question is can we can we see right? can we see that uh, this is the case this is what uh, we're going to do now so we write f2 f2xq is uh, uh, schematically fi right sum of fi convoluted with f2 hat right there is a convolution uh, remember that the convolution is this uh, integral right Uh, then in G function x over xc which is exactly what I show I, I wrote it before so this is a convolution and I write it in this in this way okay so now uh, what I unfortunately these equations are complicated by this convolution so what we do uh, formally we introduce uh, a trick uh, which is called Mellin transform. So the Mellin transform of a function is uh, a map. So I define the momenta, the momentum of a, a function or the n to be the integral of x to n minus one fx. Okay. So now I can show that. Uh, if I do the Mellin transform of a convolution, a Mellin transform transforms a convolution into a product of functions. Okay, so uh, I can prove uh, right, you can prove it yourself that if I do this, this is equal fn times gn okay so the Mellin transform of the convolution of two functions is uh, the product of the Mellin transforms of each of the two functions and this uh, uh, you can prove uh, using the equation I wrote before So the definition, the definition of a convolution. This is the convolution. This is the same as this, right? Because now I um, I integrate over um, z, right? And then it's x over y, right? So you get exact. And then there is a, a, a x which comes from from here. So this is the same as the convolution. And then by putting, by writing this you find that the, the convolution is uh, uh, simplified, right? In the Mellin space, a convolution becomes a product. So that's what we do. We work in the Mellin space. And the beauty of the Mellin space is that uh, when n is small, you can show that x is small. There is a relation with the region that x is small. And where n is large is related to the region of f where x is large. Okay. So there is a one to so if I want to know because then I will have to make statements about x small or x uh, large. I remind you that uh, x is small. Well, is the same as looking at the f of n when n is small and vice versa. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So I can just think in terms of fn 
and uh, uh, GN. So now I I I apply this uh, this Mellin transform to my convolution here, and I get and I use uh, the uh, renormalization group argument. Okay. So I impose that my F2, which is a physical object which depends on X and Q square, does not depend on orders from mu, exactly as I did before for I. Huh? Same thing, correspondence. So this is a, a RG equation which I can solve uh, for QN. So this is uh, uh, QN, Q of N divided log of mu f2 of n plus qn d f2 d log mu f equals zero same as before here you derive this times this and uh, in the in the Mellin space this is a product so it's a it's easy to and then uh, I solve this equation by separating variables, right? Because uh, now Q, I divide by Qn and divide by F2, right? So then it means that these two ratios are equal to a constant. And this constant is called anomalous dimension. And the result is that Q of n at scale mu is equal to Q on n at the scale of mu zero e to the k log of mu f over mu zero. So this k is called anomalous dimension. Which is uh, the Mellin transform of the uh, corresponding function. That doesn't, doesn't matter now, so it's a number. And therefore, I can I can rewrite the solution in this way. Now, t, I call it log of q squared over lambda squared. And then I write that q n t is equal to t0 alpha s of t0 divided alpha s of t to the d q q n so wh wh why am I'm, uh, I'm introducing now alpha s well because I have a log so whenever I have a log right, I told I reminded you at the beginning that alpha s goes like 1 over log d0 so I can take ratios of logs and express them always in terms of alpha s right? I, I keep the running uh, from alpha s so this is a handy Handy expression, it's easy. So uh, D, uh, DQQ is the anomalous dimension of the quark of the splitting function of PQQ divided with 2 pi D0. So it turns out that DQ of 1 is 0, DQQ is less than zero for n greater than zero n is uh, greater than zero for n below uh, sorry one yes sorry so I'm showing you a plot so this is something which I cal we calculate eh? it's not uh, Voila. So the, we can calculate this. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the, as I said, this is the Mellin transform of a, of a splitting function. So I the form of the splitting function I calculate, I get minus zero qq, something calculable. And these are the, the various anomalous dimensions. So there is an anomalous dimension for each splitting function. The, the one of qq, as I said, is zero at one, positive. As a value was smaller than one, and negative, 
at higher value. The one of the gluon diverges at, a, at n equal 1. Okay? So, what does that mean? Well, in, remember, n is small, n is small means x small. So, if I want to see what happens to my, to my PDF, right? My quark at small x, I'm in this region. So, at small x, dqq is positive. Okay? So, at small x, dqq is positive. This is a higher scale. The higher scale, this is smaller, right? Than one. So, this is a greater number greater than 1, which means that this object, this q, is bigger at small scale, at small x, than, uh, um, than a, a small scale. So, when you increase, in, when uh, you go, uh, you are at small x, and you increase q, this object increases. When you are a large n, uh, large n is large x, dqq is negative, so this is inverted, which means that the evolution of q at large x tends it to kill q, to make it smaller. And that's exactly what we were seeing here, right? Now this is another, sorry, this is another plot. So the f2 is increasing as small x and is decreasing as large x. So with this simple calculation, right, rather simple idea in solving this evolution for f2, we found that the first QCD corrections to the part of model go into the direction of explaining the scaling. So already in next living order, you can explain scaling extremely well. So this is, goes under the name of QCD improve part of model, but it's nothing else than QCD, right? Okay, so now you can make things a bit more complicated and solve and write all these equation of the GLAP uh, in a full way. I'm not doing it because I'm not interested in it right now. But the, you get the gist of it. Uh, the gist is that, the what is the idea? The idea is that we will measure, we measure. So this is non-perturbative information. It's a non-perturbative input to my calculation. So the idea is that we use data and small scales, right here. So we, me we make a measurement here and all x. And we, we, have a we fit the function. You know, we need a functional form uh, or a, a functional space to do this. There are several techniques. So we fit the function, a guess function, a, a small q from the data and all x. And then this evolution here is given by Altarelli Parisi, right? It's given by this evolution. So the, the, the theory is predictive, right? I measure alpha s and the given scale, right? And then I evolve it down and, and up to other scales here, right? And my theory is predictive. It's not cannot predict the value of alpha s and given scale, but it can pre once I have that, I can predict it uh, all over the scales, perturbatively. And that's what we do for alpha s, right? And exactly in the same way, if you want, uh, we do it for, um, for the PDF, okay? We use the data, and then we evolve uh, with the DGLAP uh, equation at scale. So how do, how do these functions change? Well, they change a lot, actually. This is the plot I was showing you before. But I was showing you on purpose around Q squared equal to 10 GV, very low scale, so that's where we do the fit, let's say. And then these are the same PDFs calculated, uh, evolved with the DGLAP at scales of the Higgs mass, right? 10 to the 4 GV squared is a Q of, a Higgs, of order of Higgs mass, of the Z mass, you know, 100 GV. And you see that these, sh these shapes change, uh, Right? At small, you know, there is an increase in small x. The gluon is way dominant. Uh, that gluon is divided by 10. It's way dominant. And that's the picture that we have from, uh, from the um, hadron collisions. Okay? Yes? <laughs> so, 
Say it again. Right, because this is a, so, uh, exactly. So this is a very low scale, right? So what we do, we, uh, so to speak, have a boundary condition, an initial condition for the gluon, for the B, which tells you that the below the B mass, the B content of the proton is zero. So I, I start seeing the Bs all in very high energy, very high mutuality. Because uh, there is match, I mean, there is this matching with the number of flavor, right? So this is a, the perturbative matching, which is done at the mass of the heavy quark. Very good. Okay, so now I hope you can uh, give me a pre. Yes. No, it's a global fit right now. So it's uh, I don't have a I don't have a plot here. But uh, basically, there is a plenty of data, data which is used. This is the fixed target experiment are used. Now, Tevatron, result, Tevatron measurement used. And then also LHC measurement are being used. There you have to be careful, right? Because uh, since you are also looking for new physics at the same time, you have to find processes which you think are free from new physics, right? So that is a game which is a, a tricky game to play. You have to be careful. But uh, the information now that we use for setting, for bounding and extracting PDF information is global. So MCTW, uh, CTEC, uh, and NPDF are uh, three different sets of PDF which all use global feeds. Okay, so now, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So let me rephrase it. Uh, yeah, so uh, it to what I, I was telling before, right? So one, once you use information from one collider and the given Q square uh, to, um, to make prediction and another one, you, and then maybe to discover new physics, right? Then you are assuming implicitly that this new physics did not enter in the previous collider, which is your question. Yeah. So now, imagine there is a gluino at 5 GV, right? And we didn't, we didn't see it for some reason, right? So a gluino at 5 GV would change uh, the de Glapp equation, right? Because a gluino would have a, an enormous color factor, right, like the gluon, and would be a fermion. So it would start running, uh, also in alpha S at some point, right? So it would run in alpha s, it would start running in the PDF, and we would have fitted it away, right? I mean, somewhat we have, uh, um, we, fit it, we assume that there is none, right? So we, we might fit it away, right? So this is, uh, this is something, uh, it's not really true, right? In the sense that, uh, for example, here, um, Right, if that were true, you would not get agreement with the data, even here, right? Because uh, it, then you would start deviating from this, because this uh, is assuming that there is no, uh, the running is the glap and number of frames. So there are checks uh, that you can do. But this question is general, apart from this example I'm giving. It's a very good question, and we should always be aware that this could happen, right? However, we are pretty sure we have not missed anything which is strongly interacting, or uh, which uh, we could have produced uh, before if he had enough large coupling, right? So, uh, in any case, this question you should ask yourself every time you uh, analyze a new physics model, you want to see if might be in the data. You have to think about this question every time, because you might, sometimes you might say, well, I, it might have been, it might be, and been there, I just didn't see it, right? Typically, is, this is uh, like resonances, which uh, are light resonances going to jets. These are very difficult, right? Very difficult to, to eliminate. That's a good question. Uh, we should always ask ourselves about this. Okay, so in the last uh, uh, 20 minutes, I hope you can give me the uh, last day present of uh, 15 minutes uh, before uh, before lunch, I I just want to tell you 
how uh, how we make all these uh, results that we have uh, uh, useful actually for the LHC and, and what I mean useful is that of course we at the end don't want uh, only to be able to calculate total cross-sections right we want to be able to calculate observables which are more complicated more exclusive than uh, just the uh, uh, total cross-section and in order to do that the way there is a way uh, which uh, is called Monte Carlo factor shower is a, is a, a Monte Carlo way of uh, um, of making our predictions from uh, few capitals so let's say uh, I am a Drellian process so let me let me draw this way so I have a Drellian process of this kind. Now I say, well, I'm able using this factorization formula, which I showed, I, I showed to calculate, for example, the distribution of my lepton and my PT. So this we did calculate. Higher order correction will change this a bit, but that's not uh, dramatic. But the, the name of the game is really to try to give uh, a full exclusive description of this event. Now this is a very simple because QCD here you know is all be below right uh, actually it's below here right so there is no QCD in the final state but imagine that then I do digest or uh, uh, let's say my, my preferred the process um, is like glue glue to glue to top then in this case the top is colored and therefore uh, it starts to be complicated because I know right that this gluon is colored this part of the proton is also colored because the sum was a, was a neutral so in some way right even though my short distance uh, description which is in this box here I can presumably describe it uh, with uh, uh, my perturbative QCD a short scale. At the end of the day, in the event, uh, right, this top will be A. The top will decay, and therefore the, the color of this B will have to be neutralized some way or the other with a color which is actually coming from here. Right, because uh, if I want to put a a, a B, it will give a, a B meson right at the end, right? Because it's num B number is conserved apart from uh, weak interactions, but from QCD point of view is conserved. So before uh, disappearing, it will hadronize into a B and then decay weakly. So this B is formed by a, a B and uh, a, a light quark. So we have to fish out the like work from somewhere, I will have to reconnect all colors in the event to make something which is uh, color neutral at the end first. And second thing I learned uh, right from this uh, exercise we did, uh, that even when I produce a quark and I am accelerating quark uh, in my phase space, then there, there is a probability for this quark which is uh, large. Uh, hmm, which is actually infinite, if you want, uh, right? So there is a probability that uh, uh, the quark proportional to alpha s will uh, emit, uh, right? Which we calculated before. So this is the p uh, the p uh, q q if you want, right? The, the, sorry, the the p g q the PGQ, so the, there is a, always a probability which uh, has a logarithmic enhancement, right, logarithmic enhancement, that this configuration will be dominating, the collinear and soft uh, configuration will be dominating in the phase space, okay. So if you want to give uh, a reliable description of a final state uh, and initial state uh, um, radiation, 
right, extra radiation in PP collision, we have somewhat to describe, uh, to match uh, the picture we have, a high Q squared, where there is a perturbative QCD, right, a few particles, and uh, uh, it's uh, IQ squared, uh, right? With the global picture, the global picture here, let's say, right? Outside this uh, disk uh, here. Where? Outside here, I will have fios, chaos, photons, left. And these are the objects on this side too. The object which actually end up in the detector that we are uh, we have built. So there is a there is a, a gap in our uh, description so far, the, the one which I presented you so far, which is full inclusive, right? In the sense that I'm not giving any detail. The thing I'm calculating are section for P uh, plus anything, right? Or uh, PP to TT bar plus anything, and so on. Remember, when I calculate the total cross section here, I'm calculating QQ bar plus anything, which means uh, uh, the, the two others, and that's the same here. So. The question is how do we connect uh, right, the short distance picture to the long distance one. So the way, the way to do this is to uh, build, build a history in time. Okay. So what we do, we sit uh, at high Q squared. So this is, uh, like say, now. Right, in this history, in this history that we give, uh, in terms of take an history, in terms of virtuality. Okay? So, the idea is the following. It, it's going something uh, like this. Uh, so, this is uh, the, we start the description of hard collision, hard event in the high Q squared. So this here will be our description in terms of glue glue to TT bar. In this description, be careful because this is a critical point. In this description, the virtualities of the particles in this short distance bar of order of the top mass in this process. Okay? That means that Contrary to the way we calculate this, which means that we take the two gluons of on-shell massless, when what we really mean with this calculation right, is uh, the moment in history of this event, uh, so there is an event, there are two protons which come, uh, right, and then sometime later there is a pair of tops, uh, and sometime later there is no more tops, but Hadrons and fermions, right? So this is the history I'm talking about. When I'm here, I have the two protons approaching. Okay. When I'm here, I have my event in the detector. Final state hadrons. And in the meantime, right, so the physics of this process now is order of the, the Q squared here of order of lambda QCD right, in the end, because the particle masses are order of pi, chaos, and so on. Right? Here, there also, Q squared is order of lambda Q, because you have two protons, right? Q squared. So because the protons are on shell, so they are not virtual, right? they are real. They have a very large energy, but they are real, right? they are on shell. So the Q square here is small, right? The Q square is very small. And we, in the interaction, we go through a phase where the Q square is very large, and we can calculate this process in perturbative QCD. Okay. So now, if you want, I only told you 
that what I do, I take the probability for this happening, and I ignore everything else, right? I so what say that I don't care because uh, I'm only interested in knowing how many events uh, I will produce on TT bar. I don't care where they go, uh, what they will do at the end. So I'm the all possible histories of these two tops. Okay, by summing over all possible QCD histories, I'm uh, insensitive to the histories themselves. Now, the experimentalists, however, are not sensitive to the, the, to the histories because they want to have a tool which can uh, simulate histories, that can simulate a final state fully fledged using perturbative QCD and non-perturbative inputs. So non-perturbative inputs are the PDF, and in the initial states are the PDF, and in the final state are fragmentation functions. So, for example, the probability that a quark at the end will turn into a pion, right? So, the, the Monte Carlos have all this information coded in because these objects are universal, because there is a factorization theorem that tells me that the PDF I measure in DIS can be used at the C, and vice versa with the fragmentation function. But that's the picture I need to connect. Okay? So, a part of our program, a Monte Carlo program, is nothing else than a code that uh, uses these kind of probabilities, so the splitting, the probability for a quark which is accelerate to split uh, to two objects which have uh, a smaller energy but also and above all a smaller momentum at the end, you build uh, a tool which uses that probability in uh, uh, this way, so let me let me write a couple of formulas here, which are the essential one. So you you use uh, a, a probability which you write in this way. So this is the probability that a parton branches into uh, several parton having between its virtuality in Q squared and in Q squared plus the Q squared. So here there are limits. These limits depend uh, on uh, several assumptions and decisions that you have to make. But here the I'm just saying, uh, this is the probability for a part of a virtuality Q squared to go to a virtuality lower than that, Q squared plus the Q squared, but lower, by emitting a number uh, of resolvable emission. And the resolvable means that, uh, with respect to my detector scale, I can see them as uh, uh, emissions. So this is the probability uh, for, for the branching, for one branching. So that I can write that the probability for uh, the first branching, so this is the first, uh, is equal to a function which I call uh, Q squared So this, uh, I assume there is a function whose, uh, the, um, whose derivative is telling me what is the, f the probability for the first emission, okay? So the, the probability for the first emission will be the probability that thing happen at Q squared, right, which is the derivative of this, times the probability that nothing has happened after. So this is the probability of the first emission. So this is a emission at some time, Q, right? 
And this is the, me the, the fact that this was no emission. So this is uh, exactly the kind of uh, Poissonian uh, uh, probabilities, right? You can, you can show that this is the equation for a Poissonian uh, process. And uh, by using this kind of, which is based on the splitting function. So this is the, what QCD tells me. QCD tells me that the probability of a splitting will be proportional locally, right? I'm using the collinear approximation now. The collinear approximation of, of uh, a, a quark uh, emitting, for example, a gluon is proportional to the PZ. I integrating the energy between two limits to be able to have enough energy to see the particles which are split. So I'm integrating this. And then I'm, I'm going differential, right? So this is the VQ, Q. So this is like the angle the theta on the theta, for example, right, is the same. So this is the virtuality of the particle. So this is the way the uh, particle shower uh, go. They, they use uh, this function theta, which has a, a, a name, uh, the Sudakov uh, form factor. And the Sudakov form factor is nothing else than the probability for not emitting between two scales. So Marco, this afternoon can give you a, an example taken from uh, uh, nuclear decays to show that this is uh, exactly the same as a Poissonian uh, uh, distribution. So. In the Poissonian distribution, I can use the probability for not uh, doing something as the the the, the sign, you know, the, the most important object. Because with that, the deri the derivative of this probability for non-emission is the probability of the first emission. You can convince yourself uh, uh, very easily from doing this example of the uh, radioactive decay. So, this with this probability of the first, so having this object. Right, you see that this is the exponential of this minus the integration of this. Right, so this is the probability of emitting something. The probability of emitting something between two values and exponentiated to the minus with the minus gives the probability of non-emission between two scales. This is the central object of a parton shower Monte Carlo, because once you know this, you can do the evolution of your system, which means uh, you take partons which are at high Q squared, and you assign a probability for this parton to evolve down to scales of the order of QCD, which are those which we will find in the future. And what you do also, you back evolve the initial state parton, which have a virtuality of order q squared, back with the back evolution in time to go to the initial parton, which were in the proton, we had no virtuality at all. Okay, so this is called back, back evolution. This is called forward evolution. This backward and forward evolution are generated by this uh, pseudo-comfort factor. This is the pseudo-comfort factor for the forward one. For the backward one, there is a, what do I need for the backward one? I need one more information, right? I need to fold in the PDF, right? Because uh, the backward, the backward evolution is unfolding the d -glap. right? So the d -glap equation, the d -glap equation are taking you at small, from small virtuality, right, to high virtuality. And this is what we use in our calculation, right? For the Higgs, we use them uh, at uh, here, right, at 10 to the 4. So we use PDF here, so we are, when we do the calculation, we sit here, but then my parton shower, to build an history, will have to evolve them down, so to emit, uh, uh, to emit radiation here, so 
gluon leaves an eventuality of order of the top mass, but before then, right, it evolved up to the point that it was uh, fished out from the proton. So the virtuality, this virtuality is increasing, is negative, but is increasing, right? This is a T-channel process, so all the virtuality of these guys are negative. But you start with values which are small, and you end up with values which are large. And here, you have started with virtuality in Q squared with a large, and then you start emitting, and you end up in the final state where the particles which are color connected and very small virtualities. And therefore, I can then adronize them with the model. Okay? So, nowadays, right, we are able to make computations here uh, in the perturbative QCD and link them with the part of shower history, keeping the accuracy of the, of the fixed order computation that we used in a small distance. So, normally in the past, uh, we only we could only do this in leading order, so with only leading order matrix element. But nowadays we can do it with next to leading order and even next to next to leading order computation in some cases, so that our accuracy, our precision, right, and accuracy, which means uh, our clo uh, accuracy is how close you are to the true value, precision, how small is your uncertainty. We can improve in both because we can compute this term here at higher order, and then we have a, a, a set of techniques which allows us to build an history without uh, spoiling the accuracy or the alpha s or the alpha s quadro squared of your calculation. Okay? So that's what I, I, I wanted to say uh, as a last lecture, just to give you an idea. It's very qualitative, I know. But uh, if you want to know more uh, details about this, you can go to one of the Monte Carlo MCNet schools, uh, which um, are held every year, for example. Thanks very much.